Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 260 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is comic book historian Tim Hanley. His blog, Straightened Circumstances, discusses women in comics, and he's also written about comics for Bleeding Cool, DC Women Kicking Ass, and Women Write About Comics. He's also the author of several books about female comic book characters, including Investigating Lois Lane and The Many Lives of Catwoman, as well as his first book, Wonder Woman Unbound, which we'll be talking about today. And now, here's our interview with Tim Hanley. All right, so we're here with Tim Hanley. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so as I was reading your book, I was just like, wow, you could not make up a weirder, more interesting story for the creation of Wonder Woman. Is that kind of how you felt about it as you were researching it? Oh, yeah, it's absolutely bizarre. That's actually what got me into the character. I was researching other topics in comic book history and started to see odd references to different aspects of Wonder Woman's history. And I had to go look into them. And just every single era of Wonder Woman is (laughs) bizarre in its own special way. We'll talk about the creator of uh, Wonder Woman, William Moulton Marston, and say just for listeners what's so uh, so unusual about him. So in the Golden Age of Comics in the late 30s, early 40s, when comics, superhero comics first emerged, most creators were young guys in their 20s hoping to parlay some superhero comic success into a, a newspaper strip, which was way more lucrative at the time, or like a job in advertising. They're young, hungry guys trying to move up in the world. Uh, William Moulton Marston was a psychologist. He was in his 40s, and uh, he had a different approach to the comics. He thought that comics would be a good way to influence the youth of America. So he very intentionally got into superhero comics to spend to uh, espouse his psychological theories to a, a young audience. Yeah, well, so tell us about his psychological theories. Um, at its core, Marston believes that women were superior to men and that they were going to take over the world very, very soon. He had a whole thing called disc theory, uh, dominance, inducement, submission, and compliance, and that kind of charted every various form of human interaction and, and broke it down into kind of unpleasant and pleasant uh, dichotomies. And he found that men were dominant and uh, forced compliance in their relationships, whereas women were able to induce uh, a willing submission in relationships. And he thought that this would be the better way for the world to run. Men were too aggressive, they were too violent, women were kind and loving, and thus better suited to, to lead society. And so, thus Wonder Woman, the superior woman. And his, uh, tell, talk about his personal life as well, because that's really interesting. Yeah, uh, Marston had a very unique personal life, for especially for that time. It would be unique even today. Um, he was married to Elizabeth Holloway, who he went to university with in the 1920s. It was very rare for a woman to go to university in the 1920s, and Elizabeth had three degrees. And then when Marston was a psychology professor, he met another woman named Olive Byrne, who was one of his students. And she joined their marriage as a a sort of polyamorous triad, and the three of them lived together. He had two children with each of them. He had to legally adopt all his children as his and Elizabeth's children for to allay suspicion of their, their lifestyle. But yeah, Marston lived in this polyamorous relationship with two very smart, very accomplished women who uh, contributed a lot to Wonder Woman. And all of her um, her mom and her aunt were big uh, feminists, right? Yeah, Olive's aunt was Margaret Sanger, the birth control advocate. And her mother was Ethel Higgins Byrne, who in, I think it was the 1910s, when Margaret and Ethel opened the first birth control clinic in America, um, they got arrested for doing it because it was very illegal. And Ethel kind of took the fall. She got arrested, uh, went on a hunger strike while in prison, and Margaret cut a deal where Ethel would be allowed out of prison, but she had to never be involved with, with birth control again. So Ethel was kind of out of the loop, and Margaret became the face of the birth control movement moving forward, and that's uh, that's Olive's lineage. That's really interesting. And, and also Olive uh, apparently was fond of wearing large metallic bracelets. Yeah, all the time she had these big, wide bracelets that she, she'd wear around the house, and that became the inspiration for Wonder Woman's uh, bullet-deflecting bracelets. Yeah. And also, uh, Marston invented the polygraph test, or helped invent it? Yeah, he was one of the inventors. Uh, a lot of people were working at it at the time. Um, 
He was researching systolic blood pressure and the idea that monitoring someone's blood pressure could let you know their emotional state, uh, more specifically whether they were telling a lie or not. And so he had, uh, with Elizabeth actually, they worked on this together, invented one of the, the early prototypes of the polygraph. And you think that Wonder Woman's lasso was, was so, somewhat inspired by that, right? Um, to a degree. In her early years, Wonder Woman's lasso was more about control than the truth. She could make you tell the truth, but it was only through controlling you she could make you do whatever she wanted. The lasso was more a symbol of uh, what Morrison called feminine allure, the kind of the sexual appeal of women that let them have control over men. And so that's what the lasso meant to him in the early years. It's since become the lasso of truth and has been associated with the polygraph, but that was actually not his original intention. There's actually early Wonder Woman comics where she's interrogating, uh, where Diana Prince, her alter ego, is interrogating suspected foreign agents and such, and she whips out a, a lie detector test and wires them all up in the machinery instead of actually just using the lasso. Hmm. And so tell us about, so, so he creates this um, Paradise Island, the place that Wonder Woman comes from, is kind of this interesting society. Talk about that society. Yeah, it's basically a feminist utopia. It's separated from the world of men. The Amazons 3,000 years ago had a bad encounter with Hercules, and they decided, we're sick of men, we're sick of the war, we're sick of the aggression, we're going to set up our own society. And so they set up a, a world that was uh, run by a woman. Hippolyta was their queen. And very quickly, they became more advanced than the rest of the world. They were stronger, they were faster. They had eternal life through certain gifts from goddesses. but Aside from the eternal life, they were way better off than any other person on the planet. And there was also this reform island where Wonder Woman would take villains that she captured, right? Yeah, there was a secondary island to rehabilitate female villains, not male villains. Male villains went to jail. There's no hope for those guys. <laughs> but uh, the female villains got taken to reform island where they would be kind of they would be placed in chains because chains and bondage were a key metaphor for Marston and his ideas about submission. And by being chained and being exposed to the values of the Amazons, they would learn the importance of, of loving submission to the authority of women, um, realize their own power as women, and turn away from their their crime, their lives of crime. Yeah, I mean, you say that on Paradise Islands, pretty much everyone was chained pretty much all of the time. It was just like, it's even just in the background of panels. It's not even remarked on because it's so commonplace. Oh, yeah, there's... There's like big set pieces of bondage. Wonder Woman got tied up a lot um, as games. Like they would tie up Wonder Woman to a pole and say, you can't escape this Wonder Woman. She'd be like, yes, I can, and bust out. Or uh, there's like an annual Diana's Day festival where some of the Amazons dress up as deer, run through the forest. The other Amazons hunt them, hog tie them. It's a whole elaborate thing. So there are these big bondage set pieces. But at the same time, even when there's just the most blasé panel of Wonder Woman talking to her mother, there's an Amazon walking in the background. She's got her bracelets chained together. She's got anklets on her feet that are chained together. It is everywhere on Paradise Island, and very intentionally so because it's this metaphor for submission and kind of the value of giving yourself up to the loving authority of women. Right. And you say that Marston would always justify the bondage in the comic strip by reference to the his psychological theories and the symbolism and things that you mentioned. But you say that he also was just into bondage as a fetish yeah it's a complicated thing because the metaphor does hold up so uh in a matriarchal society on paradise island bondage is a fun game it's pleasant we get to see the values of submission um in the outside world when men tie, uh, chain wonder woman's bracelets together she loses her powers bondage is always unpleasant and so we see kind of the ills of patriarchy and so by and large the metaphor holds um the thing is that bondage Imagery makes up about a quarter of all of the panels in these early Wonder Woman stories. So it's it's absolutely excessive. To, some folks have argued that other superheroes got tied up as well, which they did. But um, even a character like Captain Marvel, who got tied up all the time, had bondage in about 3% of his book's panels. So Wonder Woman was 27% bondage imagery. So it seems that there is clearly a, a fetishistic aspect to it. Right, you made the point that I thought was really interesting was that if Marston's goal was to show, was to expound his psychological theories, that you would expect 
the strips to feature lots of images of men being bound up by women and then coming to find that they liked it or it wasn't so bad or or whatever. But actually what you what you in fact see is just lots and lots of images of women tied up by men and being unhappy about it, which seems to to, to be more that it was just something that he was into rather than that it was supporting the the symbolism. Yeah, it's very much the reverse of what you would expect. And there's a sort of sadistic aspect to it almost. That might be too strong a term. But the bulk of the bondage in, in the comics is women who are having a, a terrible time being bound. And to show that so often suggests that there may have been a an element of sexual thrill to that, perhaps for Marston. Part of it was he wanted to get boys into the book. And I think he liked bondage, so he figured other guys would like bondage. And so he put a lot of it in and tied women up a lot. But I think just the the massive imbalance of it suggests um, definitely certain fetishism mixed in with what was uh, some feminist intentions. Yeah, I mean, because he did definitely have these feminist intentions, these grand ideas. And there was this really interesting thing called Wonder Women of History that was sort of a feature in the in the books. Could you talk about that? Yeah, it was a regular feature in um, the Wonder Woman comic itself. Wonder Woman actually started in several comic books in the 1940s. But in the main Wonder Woman title, every issue had a, a four-page section on a famous woman from history. I think uh, Florence Nightingale was the first one. It was Clara Barton. And it was different women from all over the world, different eras of history, and sort of their achievements um, kind of fighting against the, the limitations of, of their own eras and their own struggles. And it was a really interesting counterpoint to Wonder Woman because, of course, normal girls didn't have superpowers, but they could kind of look up to Wonder Woman as a, as a heroic ideal. But then with Wonder Woman women of history, they could kind of see more practical applications and how to be a hero in the real world. And there was this um, tennis pro, right, who was editing it? or Yeah, Alice Marble. Um, came onto the book uh, when it began and edited the first 16 issues of not the comic itself, but the Wonder Woman of History feature. Uh, she reached out to a lot of prominent American women to kind of get their ideas of who would be great to profile. And uh, so she was kind of like a celebrity get for the book. It's it's hard to tell how much work she actually did and how much was maybe ceremonial. But uh, it was definitely an interesting name to associate with the comic from the get-go, another kind of real-life female hero. Uh, Marvel was a huge tennis star in the 40s. She won Wimbledon a bunch of times. Right, and there were other women behind the scenes kind of working on Wonder Women as well, right? Yeah, um, an assistant editor at All American Comics was uh, Dorothy Rubicek. So she did a lot of the grunt work for Wonder Woman. Sheldon Mayer was the main editor who would go through the stories. But in terms of production and stuff, uh, Dorothy Rubicek was was the main gal there. And um, there were women... Uh, in H.D. Peter's art studio, H.D. Peter drew all of these early Wonder Woman stories. And um, comics in this era were kind of a factory production. H.D. Peter would draw the main bits and kind of establish the background. It would be passed down to inkers, and then it would go through colors and letters. And there were uh, various women along this process as well. Okay, and so then Marston dies in 47, and this guy Robert Kaniger takes over. And yep. he seems like kind of a hack. Is that <laughs> is that unfair? Um, he was a hack when it came to Wonder Woman, yeah. Um, today he's actually really well regarded for his his war comics. He wrote several war series uh, in the 1950s and the, into the 1960s. They're very well regarded and um, seem to be much more up his alley. Um, for some reason, DC Comics made him both the writer of Wonder Woman and the editor. So he had complete control over the book, could do whatever he wanted. And it seems he just churned out the same few stories over and over again every month for the next 20 years. And it was kind of undermining all the symbolism that um, had originally been intended. Yeah, everything that was unique and interesting about the Marston years uh, quickly faded away. All of the bondage went away, obviously, and uh, the, the feminist message behind that. Paradise Island became less of a factor moving forward. Even um, elements like the Holiday Girls, which were uh, a sorority that one woman hang, hung out with when she was in America, the kind of sh her girl gang that let her have eyes and ears throughout the country, they faded away when Kaniger took over. 
um, it just became a series of really clunky stories uh, with a more of a romantic focus as as the uh, the years went on. He was actually winning awards for worst comic books. Yeah, there's these comic book awards in the 1960s called the Alley Awards. And they're usually uh, very positive awards. It's like best artist, best writer, best ongoing series. Um, they only gave two awards that had the word worst in the title ever uh, in a couple different years. Kaniger won them both for Wonder Woman. <laughs> wow. And, this, and so then another thing that came in and kind of changed the direction of Wonder Woman was uh, Frederick Wortham. Now talk about him. Yeah, in the 1950s, um, Frederick Wortham wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent that said uh, comic books are the cause of juvenile delinquency in America. Um, in the 1950s, there was a, a considerable spike in juvenile delinquency across the country. Marston decided to put the blame on comic books. So this led uh, to Senate investigations into juvenile delinquency. Wortham testified. Uh, different publishers testified. And eventually... Um, the publishers banded together to avoid the enforcement of an outside code. They made their own code of con conduct known as the Comics Code Authority that severely uh, regulated content and made sure their books were as unobjectionable as possible. So Wonder Woman was sub subject to that, which um, really reduced what women were allowed to do um, and encouraged a focus on romance. It uh, it limited the kind of the scope of what women could be and do in, in superhero comics. But along with that, Wortham also suggested that Wonder Woman was a lesbian. Now, he did the same for Batman and Robin, suggesting that there was a kind of a homoerotic undertones to their adventures, and that's kind of more famously known. And he backed it up, actually, considerably in the book. His research was sketchy, but he had a lot of young boys saying, yeah, when I read these comics, or actually young gay boys saying, when I read these comics, it's... I can see how I feel on these pages. With Wonder Woman, he just said, she's obviously gay. She's a woman. She's not settled down. She's hanging out with girls. Clearly a lesbian. And so that influenced Wonder Woman moving forward. And you see a really increased focus on romance with Steve Trevor. She's always trying to prove her love to him. And that kind of became the main focus of Wonder Woman for the next 10 years or so. And you say that we're the, he was maybe onto something with the, uh, the lesbian subtext in Wonder Woman? Oh, yeah. I mean, the Amazons were definitely lesbians. <laughs> it's just the practical nature of it. It's 3,000 years. There's no men. Things are going to happen. <laughs> but um, Marston himself was an advocate of what he called female love relationships. He wasn't keen on male homosexuality, but um, he thought that kind of sexual relationships between women were natural because they were so inherently loving. They had so much love around. Why not share it with each other? And he saw, he linked bondage with sexuality very directly in his psychological work, submission as well. And so kind of between the lines of all the bondage on Paradise Island is uh, a clear sexual component that suggests a, a definite lesbian reading of the island. And haven't other writers for Wonder Woman just come out and said flat out that there's a lesbian or bisexual uh, component to Wonder Woman? Yeah, um, decades after Kaniger left Wonder Woman, he said, yeah, all the Amazons were gay. That's how I wrote them. And uh, today, actually, Wonder Woman is canonically queer in the Cox. Um, her writer, Greg Rucka, recently revealed that she was uh, bisexual, and it's been established in the comics as well. Yeah. Okay, so but so getting back then to the um, this period after the Comics Code Authority, when Wonder Woman becomes very um, sort of domestic um, and is interested in romance and uh, marriage and all that kind of stuff, talk a little bit more about that. About just what what kind of storylines did they have um, in that period? Yeah, well, Wonder Woman is in a difficult spot because she was a superhero comic; she had to keep saving the world and all that. The, the tone changed. She always wanted to settle down. She started she started to see being a superhero as a burden. And she'd have to constantly refuse Steve Trevor, who would propose to her and want her to spend more time with him. And it ended up, she would have to prove her love over and over again. Steve would come up with these elaborate tests, like if you have to save me in the next 24 hours three times, then you have to marry me. And maternal you is testing 
uh, dangerous jets that day. So, of course, you had to save them. And then it would be the last time would be like two minutes after the 24-hour period or whatever. There was a lot of weird romantic hijinks um, with Wonder Woman clearly wanting to settle down but just being feeling like she wouldn't be a good wife for Steve if she couldn't dedicate 100% of her life to him. And because of this pesky superhero job, that would have been impossible. And you talk about how out of step with the time all this stuff was because you're, you're starting to get into the period, you say, of Rosa Parks and uh, the, the Pill and Betty Friedan and all this stuff. And Wonder Woman is just, you say she's like going to the carnival and like fighting gorillas and all this just ridiculous stuff. Yeah, sometimes people see feminist history as, you know, women working in the 1940s during the war, and then nothing, and then the late 60s, you see the rise of women's lib. But actually, it was a, a gradual progression, and there was a lot going on through the civil rights movement. Um, women's rights really kind of started to kick up in the early 1960s. And Wonder Woman was so feminist to begin with, and really ahead of the time, and then as kind of the world progressed, Wonder Woman fell backwards and really missed out on all the early years of, of these developments. And there's actually a period where they just have her lose her powers and they're, they're just trying to completely reinvent the character. Yeah. In 1968, the book was just selling terribly. Canterbury had been on it for 20 years. Um, no one was interested in the character anymore. So DC, DC decided let's do a complete revamp. Um, they brought in Denny O'Neill and Mike Sikowski Danny O'Neill was a young guy kind of coming up in the comics world, very famous creator now. Mike Sikowski was uh, the artist on Justice League, kind of a fan favorite. So there was a, a considerable firepower behind it. They wanted to aim it at a female audience, kind of give them a, a modern take on a, a female superhero. So they had Wonder Woman uh, get rid of her powers completely. The Amazons left to kind of recharge their their magic abilities in a different dimension. So Wonder Woman gave up her outfit. She became just Diana Prince, a normal human woman, opened a fashion shop in New York City, and uh, set about to live a normal life. Uh, only problem, Steve Trevor died the very next issue. He was killed by a villain named Dr. Cyber. So Diana, who had been doing some kung fu training, decided she was going to track down his killer and spent the next four years traveling the, the globe trying to uh, avenge Steve's death. And somehow she gets kicked out of the Justice League because she has no more superpowers? Yeah, she quits. She decides, I don't have superpowers anymore. I don't belong in this this elite group, so I'm going to quit the Justice League. Meanwhile, Batman and Green Arrow are standing right there. <laughs> <laughs> don't have any powers between them. Yeah, it's just so weird. I mean, all this stuff. I mean, you say actually it's really interesting because I never knew this, but Samuel Delaney the famous science fiction author, he actually wrote two issues of Wonder Woman around this time. Yeah, the last two issues of this era uh, were written by Samuel Delaney. The book, it was only four years, but there was a lot of turnover on the book. They could never really figure out what they were doing with it. The whole era was just a mess. But for the last two, they brought in Samuel Delaney. Uh, his first issue um, ended a, a storyline from the previous issue where Wonder Woman had teamed up with Catwoman and traveled to a, a different dimension to rescue one of her friends. It's, it's a ridiculous story, but it's actually kind of fun. <laughs> and then uh, the next issue was uh, was billed as a women's lib special. Um, with Samuel Delaney writing it, you think this this might be cool and interesting. And it's just appalling. Um, the Wonder Woman has a, a roommate, or Diana has a roommate, she's not Wonder Woman at this point. Uh, her roommate is really into women's lib, tries to get Diana into it. She has no interest whatsoever. She says, most of the time, I don't even like women. And then finally it comes around that Diana kind of gets on board and that she's she's supporting the movement. And what the, the main target of this issue was this women's group that was protesting a, a store where the boss was, was sexually harassing all of the employees. So they get this the store shut down. Everyone's happy. A bunch of other women show up and say, hey, you just cost us all our jobs. Like you really screwed this up. And that's how the issue ends. The special women's list issue ends in a just massive dissension. Because you said it was supposed to probably go, the story was supposed to go longer and they kind of wrapped it up. Yeah. Know, it, issues or... it felt like an issue that should have been a to-be-continued sort of situation. But by this point, um, 
DC realized that this this kind of modern take on Wonder Woman was not working at all, and uh, the book disappeared for a couple months. And when it came back, it was the classic Amazon Wonder Woman again. Right, and it's interesting because Gloria Steinem, the prominent feminist, played a role in that. Yeah, Steinem and uh, many of her associates had grown up with the 1940s Wonder Woman, so all of the Marston stories, all of these these great tales of a, a strong female character working alongside other women, fighting the war, saving the Earth from space aliens, everything. It was great. And then they get this Wonder Woman today that's got no powers, is sad about her boyfriend all the time, and it's just kind of a mess. And she wants to see the original Wonder Woman back. And Steinem actually knew the publisher of DC, so she went in the offices a few times to kind of campaign for the return of Wonder Woman, and DC finally agreed, brought the classic Amazon Wonder Woman back, and Steinem was real excited. She had um, Ms. Magazine about to launch, so she put Wonder Woman on the first cover, uh, republished the story inside from uh, Wonder Woman's first appearance ever, and then she actually, with a, a publishing house, published a collection of Marston's Wonder Woman stories from the 40s. Like, I think it was 14 or 15 of them, the first time they've ever been reprinted. So it was this huge kind of feminist celebration of Wonder Woman. They kind of adopted her as a as a mascot. Um, tilted the feminism slightly to more match their own values than Marston's. They weren't so into the female superiority angle. Uh, they didn't discuss the bondage a lot. They focused more on equality and sisterhood and that kind of thing, which were elements of the original comic. It's just not uh, Marston's main focus. And so in the, the wider media, Wonder Woman became this, this feminist icon. Right. And you, it's really interesting because you talk about how Steinem was influenced by this book called The First Sex by Elizabeth Gould Davis. Yeah, The First Sex was uh, was kind of a, a main text for, for liberal feminism in the the early 1970s, it argued that a lot of human societies way back in, in ancient times were matriarchal and that uh, kind of patriarchy rose up, suppressed the matriarchy, erased the history, and continued on to the patriarchal society we have today. Um, historically, it's very dubious, but at the core of that is an interest in past matriarchies, which the Amazons very much are there. Figures in Greek mythology, um, one of the few female-led societies that actually seem to have uh, a historical basis. And so that connection between the Amazons and Wonder Woman and this kind of celebration of matriarchal prehistory made Wonder Woman an, an ideal mascot for, for this brand of feminism. Right, and you also say that Davis was kind of promoting this idea that Human women had originally reproduced by parthenogenesis, which seems extraordinarily weird. Yeah, that's from from certain circles. It's um, there were some feminist thinkers who argued that men were sort of an aberration that women didn't need them, that they may have been able to reproduce on their own. That men were kind of a a mutation that has since taken over the globe in disastrous ways. That wasn't a commonly held belief, but it was an element popular in certain circles. And, and Wonder Woman herself is sort of the embodiment of that. Wonder Woman was created out of clay, uh, molded by her mother, and then brought to life by the goddesses. So that's very much a form of parthenogenesis. Um, um, Marcel wasn't intentionally doing that to tie into these old theories, I don't think, but it's something that connected down the road with with certain feminist groups. Right. And so you said that, you know, they, so they, rep Ms. Magazine reprinted all these early Wonder Woman strips. And then in the coming years, those became really the only way that you could read Wonder Woman strips because everything else kind of fell out of print. And so the Ms. Magazine Wonder Woman kind of became the, you know, the, the public consciousness image of Wonder Woman. Yeah. Um, Marston stories didn't get rep reprinted in, like in, uh, a series collected form again until the 1990s. So for decades, this was the only way to get at his stories. And they came, uh, the book had a couple introductions, one by Steinem, one by Phyllis Chesler, both of whom embraced this, this liberal feminist focus on sisterhood and equality. Steinem did intros for kind of each group of stories. So it's Wonder Woman through this 
1970s lens rather than um, something that focuses on the 1940s context. So that became how people saw Wonder Woman uh, historically for the next several decades. Right. And that's the image of Wonder Woman that influenced the, the 70s TV show. Yeah, the uh, the Miss Coll- the Miss Collection brought back this kind of World War II era of Wonder Woman. So we get with the first season of the TV show. It's set during World War II. And it's got all the classic elements of the Marston comic, except for kind of the core elements, the bondage, the submission, the idea of female superiority. But it does have equality. It does have sisterhood. It has all the elements of uh, contemporary liberal feminism, just not the the core of Marston. It has the look of the Marston era, but not quite the message. Right. I don't know if I've ever actually really watched the that TV show. Did you go back and watch it in, in the course of your research and kind of what did you think of it? Oh, yeah. Uh, I watched all of them. They're fun. They're silly. Um, Linda Carter is amazing. It's, it seems very tricky to play Wonder Woman. You have to kind of... It's an odd costume to wear and you have to be able to pull it off and look kind of like regal and dignified in it. And Linda Carter seems like one of the few women who's was able to do that. She brought a real, um, a great sensibility to the character. There's a kindness to her, but a toughness to her as well. She's wonderful. Um, the the episodes themselves, not the greatest. It's typical 1970s television fare. But um, there are some great moments. There's some classic Wonder Woman villains that show up in the course of the series. That's pretty cool. Like which, like what classic villains? Um, Paula von Gunther is the big one. She was a a Nazi villain in the 1940s who Wonder Woman then reformed and she actually became an ally of Wonder Woman moving forward. And in uh, the early episodes of the TV show, she was a, a big part of those. Yeah, I mean, because you say it, like the TV show, it's not fantastic. And it seems like not fantastic kind of summarizes the rest of Wonder Woman's history, right? You say that uh, DC put out this um, guide to their essential issues and things, and they only included six Wonder Woman titles in it? Yeah, a few years ago, DC released this this, this massive list of all their, their iconic stories that were no available now to read. And Batman has like pages and pages, and Superman has pages and pages. And Wonder Woman had about six entries. There haven't been a lot of hugely iconic Wonder Woman stories over the years that have resonated with audiences in the way a lot of uh, stories from other heroes have. Now, part of that is is who this audience is. It's been a, a largely male audience who like a specific kind of story. And so there have been decent Wonder Woman's, Woman moments over the years. They just haven't really caught on in a wider way. But I'm even apart from that, Wonder Woman started in one series for the last 50 years, whereas a lot of other characters have had multiple books, kind of different incarnations in different timelines. There's Batman with his Dark Knight Returns. And Wonder Woman just hasn't had a lot of that over the years. Um, Recently she has. There's been a big push in the past few years, even since my book was published, and we've seen a lot of great Wonder Woman stories come up recently. But uh, in the decades between kind of this 1970s feminist rebirth of Wonder Woman and the early 2010s. There hadn't been a lot of major stories were. I mean, so what would you say would be some of those, the good Wonder Woman comics that people should check out? Um, The George Perez relaunch in the late 1980s is great. Um, DC rebooted their entire line in the late 1980s. Uh, George Perez took on Wonder Woman. And, um, made her modern and and fun, but also very much drew from the Marston era in terms of high percent of the Amazons, the utopian matriarchal society, and all that. So it was a great blending of the old and the new. And Perez is an amazing artist. So those books, I mean, they're 30 years old now, but they still really stand up. And uh, there have been great arcs over the years. Greg Rucka wrote the character uh, a decade ago for... I think a couple of years. We had some great stories. Gail Simone took over the book soon after. Um, her book, The Circle, is fantastic. 
And today there's a bunch of great stuff. There's uh, Wonder Woman Year One, Greg Rucka's back um, with Nicholas Scott drawing it. It's it's a phenomenal book. Kind of again reboots the character for for today. And then there's books like uh, The Legend of Wonder Woman, which is a retelling of Wonder Woman set in World War II. That's great. Draws on a lot of the elements of Marston while being something different and fresh. And uh, we've also got uh, DC Comics Bombshells, which isn't just Wonder Woman. It's all of the women of the DC universe in a, an alternate history where the the female superheroes of DC fight World War II. There's no Batman, no Superman. It's all Wonder Woman, Batwoman, Supergirl, and they fight the, the evil magical forces the Nazis have aligned with. That sounds really cool. Um, I guess, is there anything you want to say about the process of writing this book in terms of, you know, how did it come about and how'd you get it published, stuff like that? Um, I got it published through the usual ways. Uh, but I mean, the process itself is a little odd. It started, um, I started to research this when I was in university. Uh, all this research into one room became my master's thesis. And after I finished that, I decided this is some interesting stuff. I'm going to try to turn it into a book. So I re rewrote the entire thing for a popular audience. I eventually got an agent, eventually got a publisher. Various drafts later, you have a book. I mean, did you just send it to random agents, or did you know anyone? Or, oh uh, Yeah, I had to just cold email a, a ton of agents. I didn't have any connections of any sort. I mean, I live in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We're not really <laughs> a publishing mecca up here. <laughs> so, yeah, I just... Sent out a bunch of queries, um, found a great agent, and uh, we went from there trying to find the right publisher. We did, and uh, it took a while. It took about a year to find an agent. It took about a year and a half to sell the book after that. But uh, it was worth it. It turned out really well, and I'm really pleased with with it and, and the subsequent books we've done with them. Well, yeah, why don't you say what are the subsequent books? Yeah, um, my second book is uh, Investigating Lois Lane, the Turbulent History of the Daily Planet's Ace Reporter. Um, it's a complete history of Lois Lane from 1938 to the present day in both the comics, uh, television, radio, films, literally anywhere Lois has been, we talk about it in the book. And then uh, my new book, which is out July 1st, is The Many Lives of Catwoman, The Felonious History of a Feline Fatale. Uh, and it's the the same thing as with Lois. It's from 1940 to the present day. Comics, TV, movies, video games even. Uh, complete history of the character. Um, and this one's fun. It's it's from the villain's perspective. So it's a, a different arc than you tend to see with with women's history. I mean, do you, you also write a blog or a, a website or something about female superheroes. Is that right? Yeah, I blog about Wonder Woman and Lois and stuff sometimes. I also do um, statistics about Women in comics. I like to do statistics a lot in the one room book. There's statistics about the bondage imagery in uh, the Catwoman book. I've got statistics on sales and kind of percentages of readers in the letter column to try to get an idea of the audience of the books. Um, but on my website, I do uh, female creators at DC and Marvel and how these, these ratios have changed over the years. When I started in 2011, um, Female creators accounted for about 10% of the entire spectrum of creators, of cover artists, writers, pencilers, inkers, colorists, letterers, editors. Women were about 10%. And each month I kind of tabulate the numbers and keep track of how they're changing. And it's, it's grown over the years, and now we're up to uh, the high teens. Uh, Marvel was 18% last month, and... Uh, DC was close to 17%. So we're seeing some interesting growth in terms of female representation behind the scenes in the comics lately. I mean, how did you get into that? Or how did you develop that specific interest in female characters and female creators? Uh, it started with Wonder Woman. Um, my original research I was doing was, was in when I was in university was in Batman. Um, I wrote about uh, kind of the gay panic in the 1950s surrounding Wortham and the comics code and everything. And then uh, for my undergraduate thesis, I wrote about DC Comics and the comics code more broadly. But uh, seeing all these interesting tidbits about Wonder Woman here or there led me to her. And then in researching Wonder Woman, I realized that I mean, her own history was fascinating and unique and 
absolutely bizarre. And it was a story I'd never really seen fleshed out anywhere. And so from there, I kind of started to research other female characters. Um, there's some of that in the book, in the Wonder Woman book, as a comparison to Wonder Woman herself. And so through that, I got to learn uh, interesting things about these other female characters that when the Wonder Woman book was done, that's what I wanted to explore next. And so it's uh, I like unearthing these these really cool histories of of female characters that uh, don't get the attention they deserve. All the attention goes to Batman and Superman and the boys when there have been uh, female characters over the years that are absolutely fascinating and unique in their own right. Was everyone at your college cool with you writing a master's degree on superheroes, or did you have to kind of um, convince anyone about of that? Um, enough people were cool with it that it worked out. Uh, I got some odd looks here and there. <laughs> um, but it, uh, yeah, there are enough people and enough at the top that thought this was unique and different and, and we'll roll with it. Um, I actually got a grant to do my master's degree. Um, Canada kind of has a, a grant society that gives out grants for, for master's degrees. So that helped a lot, getting the grant kind of uh, convinced whoever wasn't entirely sure about it that was it was a worthwhile pursuit. <laughs> And also, I mean, there was another Wonder Woman book that came out after yours called The Secret History of Wonder Woman by Jill Lepore. I was just curious if you had looked at that at all. I have, yes. Um, it's it's an interesting book. Um, the family, the Marston family has come out rather strongly against it in terms of certain elements of it. But, um, yeah, it's the archival research. Uh, Jill Lepore does is is phenomenal. She really digs into Marston's history, Elizabeth's history, Olive's history, and it brings out a lot of uh, fun stuff. I don't necessarily agree with a lot of her conclusions, and the book is is far more about the Marston side than about one woman. But uh, there's certainly some interesting stuff in it. I don't know if you've seen that. There's going to be this Professor Marston and the Wonder Women. It's a TV show or something, or maybe a movie. Yeah, it's a movie. Do you know anything about that? Um. Just that it's coming. It's uh, I think a teaser trailer came out a few days ago, so it should be coming soonish. It's it seems to be an, an indie film, but it's it's based on Marston and Elizabeth and Olive and kind of their their lives together. Um, I haven't seen much in terms of a plot synopsis. I don't know how much it gets into the creation of Wonder Woman. I expect for copyright reasons that it's it's more about their lives together than uh, Wonder Woman herself. But uh seems to have a decent cast. Uh, the director sounds cool. Um, I'm hoping it's a, it's a good story and doesn't kind of overdwell on, on what could be the salacious aspects of it. Yeah, that's one of my frustrations with movies about writers is that it seems like they never focus on how did they come up with their ideas or anything like that. It's always a love story, basically. Yeah, and I mean, there's a definite interesting, unique love story here that will be fun to see explored, but the history of Wonder Woman's creation is, is really cool as well. And it would be fun to see if uh, they get into that and kind of incorporate the ways that both Elizabeth and Olive contributed, because that's something that's that's missing from a lot of the discourse about Wonder Woman's history. Yeah. Okay. And so now, the, what? so then what did you think of the new Wonder Woman movie? Oh, man, I loved it. It was so good. Did you, what were your expectations going into it? Um, initially I was sort of concerned just because Man of Steel and Batman v Superman and Suicide Squad were really not my jam at all. I did not care for those films. And so, uh, the news of a Wonder Woman movie, while well, I was excited, excited, I was trepidatious, especially early on, there was a lot of turnover when Michelle McLaren was supposed to direct. She dropped out and Patty Jenkins came in. Then the teaser trailer started to come out and it looked really cool. And then the full trailers came out and it looked even cooler. So by the time uh, the movie came out uh, the other week there, I was I was excited. I was cautiously excited because I've been burned before. I remember being extremely excited for Man of Steel and then having one of the worst evenings of my life. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I was excited, cautious, and then it started and it was just, man, it was good. There's like a preamble at the beginning, Wonder Woman in the present, kind of 
looking back, and that's fine. But then they cut to Paradise Island, and they do this massive sweeping shot, and it's just gorgeous and perfect, and there's young little Diana who wants to be a warrior, and it's just the best. I mean, when I uh, when I set up this interview with you it was a couple of weeks ago, and at that, I guess maybe I was uh, naive or something. I didn't expect the film to be such a um, a cultural phenomenon. I mean, how to put it that, that it was gonna um, there's gonna be so much discussion of the movie. I mean, you know, as as like you, I was afraid it was gonna be bad, and so I was afraid it was just gonna kind of gonna disappear. But have you been surprised at all about just how much discussion this movie has created around it? Um, a little bit. I expected some. I mean, it's the first kind of major superhero film with a female lead in this this new boom of superhero movies. And even before, it was like Catwoman and Elektra in 2004. which are not necessarily iconic superheroes. So really, it's been since Supergirl in the 80s that we've had a, a major movie with a female lead. So I expected a, a certain amount of coverage. But uh, not this much. It's really been extensive and it's great um everyone's talking about wonder woman everyone so many people have connections to the characters from different incarnations over the years and it means she means so many different things to so many different people so to see all this coverage to see all these different perspectives it's it's really great i mean have any of the responses stuck out in your minds in it at all um there's been some interesting critiques of the movie actually in terms of of race because well there are um some people, uh, people of color in the movie, they're not necessarily in the forefront. There's certain stereotypes. There's a, a Native American character who's named Chief and, and uses smoke signals. And while there's uh, some Amazons who aren't white, they're not necessarily given a big role. So it's it's a great movie, but it's also, uh, there's ways to do better. And so some of those critiques have been really interesting and thoughtful and written, I think, really well. It's not... No one who is critiquing the movie seems to be out to trash it. They seem to think this was a good movie. Um, there are ways we could be even more inclusive moving forward. And I think that's kind of what Wonder Woman is all about, is kind of inclusive and being a hero to everybody. So that's kind of really nice to see. I mean, one thing that's really struck me is just how many people are talking about what an emotional reaction they're having to the movie. Um, I've seen a couple of people post variations on this where somebody says, no wonder white guys are so confident all the time. I saw one Wonder Woman once and I'm ready to go into battle. Yeah, it's, those are really cool to see. It's great because Wonder Woman's such a phenomenal character, but she's kind of known as, as an icon more than a person. Everyone kind of knows Wonder Woman, knows what she stands for, but because she's only had one comic, she hasn't had a movie, she hasn't had a TV show since the the 70s um if you didn't watch the justice league the uh, animated show in the early 2000s um you probably haven't been exposed to wonder woman in any kind of adapted form or probably even in the comics because they don't really sell a lot so for everyone to get to see the character to get to see her in action in a way that really captures the essence of the character is awesome and the way it's resonating with everyone is, is so so cool there was some talk I saw before the movie came out saying that the studio was not going out of their way to promote it. Did you follow that at all? Yeah, I actually wrote a piece about it on my blog because about uh, a month before, things had been sparse. Like um, with Batman v Superman, Batman and Superman were everywhere. I mean, there was cereals. There was every commercial I saw was Batman and Superman. They tied in with every product humanly possible. It was a massive, massive campaign. And then a month before Wonder Woman, I think she's on like a can of Dr. Pepper, and that's about it. But uh, subsequently, Warner Brothers really ramped it up. Um, they started to release more trailers. They started to get more stuff out there. And you could see the buzz building and kind of spreading to the online community really well. Um, definitely picked up as the movie approached and kind of started to uh, to have some sway. I mean, I don't know if you've seen these things where the director was saying that, you know, one of the most popular scenes in the movie is this scene where Wonder Woman kind of single-handedly charges across no man's land in World War One, And she was saying that she really had to fight to get that scene in the movie. I yeah. It, Have you followed that? Um, I followed it a bit. It seemed that um, certain executives at the studio just uh, didn't understand the purpose of the scene. 
because it's the way it's set up uh, in the film is Wonder Woman gets to kind of the front lines of the First World War, sees that there's a, a village across the way that the Germans have taken over. They've kind of enslaved the villagers. And one was like, well, I'm going to, we're going to go stop this. And Steve Trevor and everyone was like, no, we can't. There's a bunch of trenches in the way. Um, we have to play this strategically. This is a long game. Because World War One was a stalemate for four years, basically. There'd be a few miles here and there, back and forth. And that's the mentality of, of all the men in the trenches. And Steve basically says, we, we just can't do anything about it. And one woman says, well, I can. And she climbs up the ladder and brushes off across no man's land and deflects all the bullets and takes enough of the heat that Steve Trevor and the guys can kind of come up behind and they take the crunches and they save the village. But um, I guess executives did not understand the importance of, of Wonder Woman seeing war and rejecting the conventional wisdom of it that people have to die sometimes, that there's certain things we can't do anything about. Whereas for Wonder Woman, it was very much, I can do something about this and I'm going to do something about it. And it was a really pivotal moment in the film. Yeah, I, I really, really liked that. I really, really liked all this stuff on Paradise Island. I just thought the imagery of these these warrior women fighting the German soldiers was just really visually striking and just powerful. Um, I thought Gail Gadot was just absolutely fantastic in this role. Um I thought like toward the end, I was a little, I thought, I felt it got a little like too familiar superhero movie territory. I don't know if you feel like that at all. Yeah. I didn't think the end was, was bad in any way, but it felt certainly more conventional than the rest of the movie. I mean, that Amazon battle scene at the beginning was phenomenal. I don't think I've ever seen an action scene like that in a superhero film. It was so cool. And then the no man's land scene was incredible. So then to have kind of a, a generic big bad fight at the end, which was had has had his moments, um, and the message of it was fantastic. I loved uh, Diana's interactions with the bad guy, who I won't say because it kind of <laughs> gives it away. But yeah, just because the earlier action scenes were so amazing and intense, having something that was a little more familiar and explodey and kind of the classic superhero movie grand finale fight. Um, was slightly underwhelming just relative to everything that came before it was still cool yeah no i agree with that i mean the other maybe criticism i have or is that i mean and i'm not super familiar with wonder woman from the comic books so you can tell me what you think about this but i thought that for an 800 year old woman i thought she was too naive like even granting that she's not familiar with this modern society and everything i thought that after 800 years um you know she wouldn't be that naive I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, that's the tricky thing with Wonder Woman because the Amazons themselves are like 3,000 years old. And because they have this kind of access to magical eternal life stuff, they've been around forever. Um, the exact age of Wonder Woman is never quite specified. Like in the movies, I don't think they say she's 800 years old. I thought some of the um, external material. Had yeah, been. some of the external materials might have, but within the context of the film itself, um, we don't get that. We just get that. It it seems like Diana's born maybe twenty five years before the war. It's only bringing in these external materials that they seem to have not talked about in any way in either of the films she's been in. Um, is how we get this interpretation. But it's been a thing that's been an issue with with one woman generally. No one knows how old she is because everyone's kind of purposely vague about how long she's been on Paradise Island before she goes into the world of men. But I think with the film itself, because they don't specifically mention the age, I think it kind of works. And I think maybe what we would see as naive is perhaps just the result of her being raised in, first off, a utopian society. She's not used to this kind of the horrors of the world of men at all. At the same time, it's it's more of an optimism, I think. I think if something's bad, she's going to fix it. If something's in the way, she's going to go through it, um, no matter what anyone else says. So I, did, I didn't see the that kind of naiveness. I can see how you might have, but uh, it worked for me. I think she was more idealist. Yeah, I mean, I... I... 
all the stuff she did, I thought was really good. And I think that it would not take a lot of tweaking to allay that um, concern of mine. But but as you say, yeah, I thought she was like a little too naive and I would have liked to see it more. Like she could do all the same things, but out of a more wise, idealistic, um, you know, attitude. I think that's going to be the Wonder Woman we're going to have moving forward, like with Justice League in November and stuff. I think we're going to see the wiser, more experienced Wonder Woman. And in some ways, I think this film is kind of the the younger and experienced, kind of wide-eyed, innocent Wonder Woman getting used to the this outside world. Yeah. Um, what did you make of the, uh, I don't know if you saw this headline, Fox News asks, is Wonder Woman American enough? <laughs> Wonder Woman's not American at all. She is okay. very much an illegal immigrant. <laughs> <laughs> In the 1940s, when she comes to America, uh, she doesn't like just make up her own identity of Diana Prince. She meets a woman named Diana Prince who is crying on the sidewalk because her boyfriend just moved to South America and she wants to go live with him and doesn't have any money. One was like, hey, we look alike. I have some money. I'll give you this money. I'll take your identity. You go live in South America. And that's how Wonder Woman became Diana Prince. So that's identity theft. That's illegal immigration. <laughs> it's, there's, I mean, Wonder Woman wears uh, an American-themed outfit, um, specifically in the 1940s, so she fits in the world. The war is on, and she wants to wear something that's recognizable to the nation that she wants to help. But um, Wonder Woman's not an American hero to me in the way that, say, Superman is or certainly Captain America is. She's more a global hero. Her What she cares about, what she stands for, sort of supersedes national boundaries to me. Right. What did you think of the, the Wonder Woman costume in this movie? Because I, I really liked it. I thought I liked it a lot better than the the other <laughs> other uh, outfits I've seen. Yeah, it was pretty good. Um, certainly compared to other outfits, yeah. Like... Um, they did a Wonder Woman TV pilot uh, five years ago, maybe. That costume was awful. It was shiny, plastic. Just didn't capture the character at all. I think what uh, the movie costume did was take kind of the iconic look of Wonder Woman's comic book outfit, which we all know, and translate it into a way that made sense for this kind of martial Amazon society, but also just realistic in a way that would make sense on the big screen. That's what superhero movies are good at lately, is taking these kind of bright, bold, often simple costume designs and translating into something that feels like it could be real. And I think uh, they did that really well with this costume in uh, in ways that captured the the iconic elements of it while being something new and, and appropriate for the screen. It was also a lot better than Batman v Superman when it was brown all the time. They actually put some color into it in this movie, which was was very nice to see. Right, because even in the comics, haven't there been multiple redesigns of her outfit? Like, there's one where she's dressed more in black and has kind of a like a leather a blue leather jacket or something like that. Yeah, there've been redesigns over the years, but um, they never last for more than a few months because people want the iconic Wonder Woman. So yeah, this this leather one you're talking about was from the early '90s. Um, Wonder Woman got superseded as wonder woman she uh an amazon named artemis challenged her and she became the new wonder woman and wonder woman just became i don't even remember what she went by just diana i guess but yeah she had this like weird leather bra thing with a blue jacket and it was terrible and then uh in 20 2009 dc did a, a huge revamp of wonder woman where they gave her pants and a leather jacket again it was a huge thing. It was all across the news. Um, they're trying to update Wonder Woman, which is uh, never a good idea. They never do that well. And that lasted about a year before they went back to a more classic look. They've tried different things over the years. People want to see her in in what you expect Wonder Woman to wear. What did you make of the, the Alamo Draft House women-only screening of Wonder Woman? I thought they were a fun idea. It's This the first female superhero movie ever. Let them have a party and go to town with it. I thought the reactions online were foolish. I was reading an article this morning that I thought was really interesting where it said that in the past, these sorts of, um, uh, what would you call them, uh, like flashbacks or something, that, um, have been treated in the media more seriously. 
And in this case, the, the Alamo Draft House was kind of poking fun at the people who were complaining online and the media was kind of the headlines were more poking fun at them and that we've maybe had a turning point where um, people are, you know, just just treating this more as a joke than anything else. Yeah, it seemed like, I mean, there were a few dummies who were upset about it and were kind of being loud on the internet. But by and large, everyone else was just making fun of them for being so ridiculous. So, yeah, I think it could definitely represent uh, a turning point in, in these kind of discussions. It's, I think all the jokes were definitely acknowledgement of we all live in a patriarchal society. So reverse sexism isn't a thing. Let these women have fun together at the One Woman Show. And that seemed to be the, the dominant reaction. Yeah, so so now that this movie has come out and it was a big hit and everything, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about doing a, a, a expanded revised edition of your book, because the book, it kind of ends on sort of a downer note where it's like, oh, and Wonder Woman is kind of nothing that exciting has happened, <laughs> um, you know, in decades. And that's the end. And it seems like you might be able to have uh, have the book end with uh, kind of more of a bang now that all this other stuff is happening now. Yeah, the book came out in 2014, which meant I finished writing it in 2013. And in the four years since, man, uh, things have turned around. <laughs> so, yeah, there's uh, certainly maybe a new epilogue would be would be called for, given all the, the developments lately. It's things, Wonder Woman's Lot in Life has gotten a lot better on every possible front in the comics. She's doing really great stuff that's getting a lot of attention. The movie is a massive hit, obviously. So, yeah, there's certainly uh, some updates that might uh, change the tone of the end of the book for sure. And you've seen the headlines. This was just this morning, I think, that um, the Robin Wright character, Antiope, is coming back in the Justice League movie. Yeah, that's going to be – I don't know how they're going to do it. Again, It's going to involve God somehow, I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, it might be a flashback. His – and I don't want to get into spoiler territory again. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, however they do it, man, I'm on board. She was fantastic. That friggin' jump, spin, triple arrow shot, <laughs> that was that was amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so we're pretty much out of time. So why don't you just say a little bit more about um, any other projects you want to mention? You mentioned you have this Catwoman book coming out. You want to say anything more about any of that stuff? Yeah, um, One Room and Unbound is in stores online now, uh, so is Investigating Lois Lane, and Catwoman's out July the 1st. Um, it's going to be real fun. Um, with One Woman and Lois Lane, um, they're very different characters, but they follow a similar trajectory that kind of tracks the typical ups and downs of, of women's history over the past seven or eight decades. With Catwoman, because she's a villain, she's very much an outsider, and it's a very different evolution for her in, in unique ways that I think are really interesting and fun. Plus, there's like an entire chapter on Batman Returns, which was a blast. And there's also an entire chapter on the Catwoman movie, which is terrible, but so much fun to write about because it's so bad. Are there any really colorful characters like Marston um, who are behind the scenes on the Catwoman? Um, um, creation of Catwoman? I mean, no one's as colorful as Marston. <laughs> he's, the, he's the top of the list when it comes to comic books. Um, with Catwoman, there's some interesting figures. Uh, the opening of the Catwoman book is basically a, a lengthy refutation of the Bob Kane myth. Bob Kane is held up as the creator of Batman and, and all these other elements of the character. Um, when really uh, his co-creator and writer Bill Finger is really responsible for a lot of the things we associate with Batman. Um, and with Batman being Batman instead of Birdman, which was Bob Kane's original idea. <laughs> but Bob Kane was smart enough to get a contract that named only him and not Bill Finger when he created Batman. So he's been uh, he's been associated with the character ever since and has fiercely defended that he was the sole creator until his death. And it's only in recent years that kind of Bill Finger's influence has come up. So we, we dig into the grandiose claims of, of Bob Kane to start. And uh, there's a few characters throughout. There's a chapter on um, Frank Miller's takes on Catwoman in uh, Dark Knight Returns, All-Star Batman, and uh, Batman Year One kind of digs into Miller's problematic depictions of women. It's kind of fun. But yeah, no, no one quite as fascinating as Marston. <laughs> yeah, 
You know, a year or two ago, I interviewed Gwen Weldon, who wrote a book called um, Batman and the Rise of Nerd Culture. Oh, yeah, that's a great and book. And that's where I learned about the... The thing that sticks out in my mind is that um, Bob Kane on his uh, tombstone, he has his um, his epitaph is something like, here lies Bob Kane, the genius behind Batman who was touched by the hand of God to inspire him to write Batman. It's something like that. It's just out of out of control. Man was an egomaniac and <laughs> just an absolute liar. <laughs> Um, all right, well, Tim, I think uh, we're all out of time, so I think we're going to wrap things up there. And so we've been speaking with Tim Hanley about his book, Wonder Woman Unbound, The Curious History of the World's Most Famous Heroine. So, Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It was a blast. And that was our interview. So a big thanks again to Tim Hanley for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue – please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I'd like to give a special thank you to Rachel G. Payne, who just became PayPal patron number 150. So big thanks again to Rachel and everyone else who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.